welcome back to The Balanced Life. Today we're gonna to be talking about real estate investors and it says real estate investors take note. This is not necessarily those of you who are already in it, but maybe you're thinking about doing it, you're looking at it, you've heard about it, you've got some questions. Maybe you're living in an apartment and you're thinking, you know what, it would make a lot more sense if I just bought my own house. This is for you as well. Um, real estate can be a really great way to create wealth, to create um, a stream of income, to offset some uh, money. Uh, there's a couple of YouTubers, um, Bigger Pockets and The Real Estate Ninja are the first two that come to mind, but there's a few others that I watch fairly regularly and I'm learning from, and I will link them in the description below. But the thing I wanna talk about today is for real estate investors, somewhat for people who are looking to buy their own property, but primarily people who would like to create income from this. Some things to think about, not so much from an investment standpoint, but from a human standpoint and as a, a person who will be a landlord, understanding what that role is and some things to consider. So first of all, before you go into real estate investing, make sure the numbers work. Cap rate, net profit, uh, don't buy at a loss, have a clear growth plan. The reason for this is because I don't think a lot of people that become slum lords, as we called them when I was a kid, set out to become a slum lord. I think people get overextended and they're not able to keep up with the repairs and things that need to be done just in the normal day-to-day -day operations. And they get behind just like in our own life. We may not be able to fix up our house the way we had planned. And so we end up living in a yuckier house than we really planned to. So it's very important when you start to look into investing that you make sure the numbers make sense and double, trickle, triple, quadruple check using different kinds of metrics, different kinds of calculators, worst case scenarios, all those things. Second thing, make sure you know why you're doing it and that the properties that you're purchasing are in line with those goals. So are you doing it just because of tax incentives like depreciation, offsetting income, things like that? Are you doing it to have a stream of income? Are you doing it because you wanna be a decent landlord? One of the things I really want to do is own apartment complexes, um, and I've wanted to do this since forever, but one reason I personally wanna do this and have really been focused on doing this for the last seven or eight years, and this includes apartment com complexes, um, trailer parks, um, like, apartment communities, not just like a single building, but whole communities, is I want to be a good person that makes the properties that I own a nice place to live. Sometimes we forget when we're investing in real estate, we see it as a building that generates income, but it's really someone's home and their life is tied to that. And I've talked about that a little bit when I was talking about my daughter trying to find an apartment and I will be dealing with this later. Incidentally, she has moved in. Yay, great. Um, but understanding why you're buying and working on properties that meet those goals, not just buying to get something bought to try to meet a goal like, oh, okay, I got my first thing bought. Yeah, sometimes it's a matter of getting on base, but other times it's a matter of making sure that you're getting on the right base. If you run to third base instead of running to first when you hit the ball, what's the point? Okay, so... Are you trying to become, um, well, let's scrap that. I think we've made that point. Number three, make sure you remember the human side. I started weaving in that way just a minute ago, but this is a person's home and it's not just what you can get out of it. This comes out of, uh, mind you, I'm a business person. I am purchasing properties to make a profit. I am saving up large sums of money and sacrificing personally on things to get together money so that I can purchase a um, multifamily properties, like smaller ones, like duplexes and quads, to work my way up to the larger complexes over time, unless something opens up really great, and then yay, thank you God. But um, but I also think it's very important that we remember. Again, this is someone's home, the human side of this, and making sure you have the systems in place to make it a pleasant place to live, to make it a stress-free place to live, to make it um, a place that people 
like to be at. I heard one investor, I mean, he owns, I don't know, like a few different hundreds of units. And he made this point very clearly. He said, if somebody's um, shower is broken, it's not a project that I can get to on Thursday. That's an issue in someone's home. You know, we have to remember that each of these units are, yes, income generating spaces, but that's where someone's life happens. It's where their kids are playing in the bathroom. And if the toilet is backing up, that's a problem. It's where um, if there's a pest control problem, they're having to deal with things that would annoy us. If it's um, the sewer has backed up into a ground floor apartment and it's all over the carpet. I had that happen in my first apartment. There was this huge sewage backup in because it was a two bath, it was a two bedroom, two bath uh, apartment. And the shower was in the second bath, like it was in a the bedroom. It was like a master bath. Um, and it backed up and it went all over the floor because it was really low ledge because it was just a shower stall, not a bathtub. Backed up, went into the changing area, all over the carpet, soaked into the carpet, stunk it up. And the apartment complex was like, oh yeah, well, we'll get to it. Then we had the air conditioner outside the other bathroom, which was in the little hallway area, leaked water constantly. We had times where the heat didn't work. This was back in 94, 95. We would turn on, because we had free gas at that apartment, we would turn on the gas burners of the stove and open the oven and turn it up to 400, trying to heat our apartment because the gas heat was not working. And they were like, yeah, we'll get somebody on it. We'll try to get to it in a few days. Well, a few days without heat. I mean, think about how you feel if you lose power um, to your home. You don't want to do that to other people. You need to make sure that you have the systems and things in place that you can deal with issues quickly because this is their whole home. Um. In line with that, number four, make sure you don't get taken advantage of. So people lie. You need to have clear boundaries. But in those boundaries, look for a win-win. Try to find ways where you can establish yourself as a clear but fair landlord. Make sure you, by keeping your word to fix things quickly. Um, making a system whereby people feel comfortable letting you know if they're falling onto bad times, that um, there are late fees and things like that, but there is also humanity. And if they make a partial payment, maybe you don't issue a late fee until it's gone X number of days. Or if they come to you with proof that they have lost their job and this is what they're doing to get their job, or this is the reduction in hours, and they are making a half payment, Maybe you're able to work with that and can set something up. Think about these things in advance so that you can let people know in writing and quickly, this is the policy that I have. Because we won't have a perfect scenario. We won't have a perfect situation. Things do happen. And as someone who was, I mean, I had an over 800 credit score in my late 20s. And then my husband got cancer and our finances completely fell apart and were destroyed for a number of years. But we did everything we could to pay every bill we could. And most of our creditors worked with us and we got them paid off, all but one of them. And they came after us with a vengeance, sued us. And so to this day, despite um, offers that they send us, we flatly refuse to work with them and neither will our kids. But the other creditors that we had in the past that worked with us, allowed us to have payment plans, let us get caught up, didn't come after us viciously. We reestablished relationship with them after we got back on our feet. And now we have a very great business relationship with those creditors um, when we need it. I mean, we pay off every month. So they don't make much money off of us other than transaction fees. But hey, um, so make sure you don't get taken advantage of, which means having policies in place that you can implement if people fall into hard times. Um, I heard on, again, that Bigger Pockets that I mentioned at the beginning of this um, video, one of their ideas is you buy somebody's keys. So if somebody is delinquent, rather than go into a foreclosure kind of thing, or eviction, rather, I guess if it's not foreclosure, it's eviction, rather go into an eviction situation, which can cost you a lot of time, a lot of money, all these things, you can say, all right, if you vacate by this date, I will 
refund to you your security deposit plus you know a month's rent or a half month's rent and that allows them to have some money to move you don't give it to them until they've given your keys back and gotten moved out but if they're stuck there they're just going to squat until they're forced out and you don't want to do that that's not good for anybody so you say as long as the apartment is in this kind of condition as long as you're out by this date then i will refund this to you when you turn in the keys i thought that was a brilliant win-win because evictions are incredibly expensive and it's going to cost you way more to evict them than it is to lose two months rent um so that's what i mean by a win-win so that may not be your um preferred way of doing it but it just gives you an idea of some flexible ways to think about things so here's a few suggested resources um like I said, Bigger Pockets, um, The Real Estate Ninja, he also has another channel that's got like 253,000 subscribers or something called The Economic Ninja, but he has a course that he's teaching um, for sale. He has tons of videos. You don't have to buy anything, but if you want his course for sale, look at some of The Real Estate Ninja videos, and he has a discount code, um, and it's pretty significant. I want to say it's like half off. So those are a couple things that you can do, and... Um, if you are interested in hearing about things that you can do if you want to get your first home or ways to try to um, afford your first home, let me know in the comments below and I will put together some videos on that. Uh, thank you for your time and I will see you on the next video.